Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of morning studies and study number 141. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> a dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for the blessings of the past uh, Sabbath, the studies that we have had, and the time that we've had to reflect and consider your goodness and love. And we are thankful, Lord, that we can meet here this morning to open your word together, to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11 and to understand the truth for our time. We just invite your presence uh, into this meeting, into our lives, and we ask for blessings for this week of study uh, that we can uh, clearly discern uh, the truth that's in your word. We ask for a blessing for each person that you can watch over them, and our loved ones that your angels can take care of them. And help us, Lord, to represent you uh, to all we come in contact. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So we we had finished uh, this line, um, though we started looking at some details of it again. And so they're just going to address a few little details. Um. Now, when we were uh, in the study last time, we were dealing with the arms of a flood that shall be overflown. I don't know if people remember. We had talked about uh, 2,220 days, uh, 2,220 days as being connected to the word arms. And so we were discussing uh, the word arms. It says, with the arms of a flood uh, that shall be overflown. How does it go exactly? So it's in verse 22. And, and with the arms of a flood, they shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now that verse, uh, verse 22, 11, 22. Is there a symbol in that verse number itself, which we haven't talked about? Are you talking about 220? No, just 11, 22, the symbol of the verse 11.22, just 11.22, what's the symbol there? November 22nd, right? All right. Now, November 22nd, what is that symbol? Where do we have November 22nd? Can we connect this to what we're looking at here? So if we go back to 977 BC, and we go to uh, the 15th day of the eighth month, on the biblical calendar, that's going to be uh, Jeroboam offering upon the altar in Bethel, right? And then the disobedient prophet is going to come in um, and give the prophecy of Josiah, right? And that's going to be November 22nd. All right. Okay. Now, when I'd done the study, Heidi and I had done the study dealing with the thanksgivings, uh, these these counterfeit feast days. So we went back to 977 and we tied that to uh, the Thanksgiving of, of, of 2018. So that was November 22nd in 2018. Um, and so, you know, we made a prediction that is, we said we have, we can connect this back to 977. We can connect the uh, uh, the dividing of the United Kingdom and the Civil War together in uh, 742 BC. And then we can connect uh, those to the Revolutionary War in the United States and to the Civil War in, in the 1860s. And then we could connect all of that to 2018 to the Thanksgiving. And so we call it the Thanksgiving Day pr Prediction. And, and the purpose of that was to decide, can we predict external events? That was the question that I believe that that prediction was meant to answer, the reason why it was given to us. Now, of course, that was rejected by FFA. That is, they didn't want to look at it. They didn't even know what it was. They didn't care, right? They just had decided for whatever reason that, um, you know, I was uh, 
an uncontrollable element at uh, the School of the Prophets there. And so they, they just didn't want to have anything to do with it. Now, a year later, Jeff studies it. So he's going to study that on November 10th, 2019. And he's going to say that it was sound, right? So he's going to say, you know, that this makes perfect sense. We already understand all of these things. He had a different interpretation of what occurred, um, but he believed that it was sound. Now, that was recorded. There was three studies, two done completely by me, and one where Jeff goes up on the whiteboard and and we sort of discuss it. He draws things and, and gives his explanation. Um, and they were recorded, but I was not given a copy, and they never did release them. So they didn't want people to know about what actually Jeff had said about the Thanksgiving Day prediction. Uh, but Stephen and Odilio were there, um, amongst other people, but um, they could testify to what, what actually happened, as well as my wife Heidi watched on Skype. She watched the first presentation on my phone, right? So she, I connected with her. She was back in in uh, Leduc at the time. So, so anyway, we have that symbol November 22nd. So to me, there's a lot attached to that verse. Daniel 11 verse 22 has that connection. And then the verse itself, so we should probably look at this, right? So that's going to be this part here, right? Now, the verse itself talks about um, with the arms of a flood, shall they be overflown? And there's this thing about this alleged seditionist. And we haven't really fully understood um, how to understand who the they are. So we were talking at the end of the study on Thursday about who the they could be referring to. Um, now, it could be referring to they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, right? It could be referring, that could be the they. Um Obviously, his interpretation of this, the alleged seditionist, that is Swearingen's interpretation of this, is, um, and for some reason I ended up shutting it, closing it, so I'm going to have to go. I don't know why. Okay. Um, so it has to do with his interpretation of, of when this is referring to. And he's going to have, um, just looking at the verses, okay. So he's going to say, um, dealing with the verses that go before. So he's going to go back to verse 20. He's going to say, then shall stand up in Caesar's estate, Caesar Augustus, a raiser of taxes named Caesar Augustus. In the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle, but his dies a peaceful death in AD 14. And his, that is Augustus's estate, in his estate, Augustus's, shall stand up a vile person, that's Tiberius Caesar, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably, that's, there's a peaceful transference of power after Augustus's death, and obtain the kingdom by flatteries false flattery of the Roman Senate. Um, so, so this, we would, of course, we applied this to um, uh, Caesar's estate. Of course, that's Julius Caesar, right? So that's going to be uh, George Bush the second, and then Augustus is going to be Obama and Tiberius is Trump. That's how we've understood it for quite a long time. Um, and then it says, with the arms of the flood, shall they, these are alleged seditionists, shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken, executed. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. So Christ is also going to be crucified, right, executed. And, and that's where I have the problem with, if, if we're talking about alleged seditionists, here he's just referring to uh, Tiberius's uh, paranoia, Paranoia regarding people trying to take over um, his throne, right? But um, we would have to look at these alleged seditionists, what 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 he puts here as the alleged seditionists, as um, not people who are seeking to take over the throne, but people that are connected with 
Christ himself. That is, this flood would refer to persecution. And um, so does persecution happen under Tiberius? Persecution of of Jews or Christians. I don't recall that it does. Yeah, so we don't have any any particular um, persecution of of Christians that I know of in the reign of Tiberius. And in fact, Tiberius um, did not want to persecute Christians. It, that that um, uh, he he insisted that Christians not be persecuted nor even accused. Okay. So if we're going to try to apply this to Trump or, or to Tiberius and to Trump, uh, we would have to actually say that this is, this is talking about another period. So when it says, and with the arms of a flood, they shall be overflown from before, uh, before him and shall be broken. This can't be referring to what happens under Tiberius. Does that make sense? That the hymn can't be a reference to Tiberius. I would have to agree. Okay. Good. So, so there's, so there's a, just an assumption that's made. And the assumptions always are, um, because of English, that when we have a personal pronoun, that we, we usually just refer it to whatever person is before, right, in English. But in Hebrew, that's not the case. So, so who could the him refer to? So we have this they, and I'm saying that they can't be the alleged seditionists. And that, and that because we have a symbol here of persecution, the arms of the flood, uh, with the arms of the flood, they shall be overflown. And so, uh, we would have to decide who this is and when it is. Because this is going to lead us up to the crucifixion. But we're saying in that time, there is no persecution. So, so we have to decide who the they are and who the him is. Could the they be the, the church magnet, so to speak, the higher ranking clergy and those that hate, hate us in our time and at just as they were hating Christ in his time? Okay. Well, it says that they shall be overflown with the arms of a flood. So now it could be referring to something that's going to happen later in the future after the crucifixion. Right. So, um, and 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 then we also have just just sort of an with this final uh, phrase here. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. What? You understand what I, what I'm saying? Was uh, the prince of the covenant executed? Right, broken. Is, I mean, and that makes sense. But the question is, if he's broken and and they are broken, and and then when it says from before him, uh, you know, but from before his face, right? That's what it means. Um, because you see the word six four four zero, that's panin, panin, panin. I always have trouble saying it, but it's it's the word that means face. From before his face, his presence. Okay, so it's before somebody's face that that with the arms of the flood they shall be overflown. So now, could we say that they are the Jews, or, or better, the Jewish nation? So how would the Jewish nation be overflown? Destruction of, of Jerusalem in seventy A.D. Well, that really takes it out of Tiberius's range. Right. So this isn't in Tiberius's period. Now, so it's, it's going to point us to the, the, the final, the destruction of the Jewish nation. Right. Because, 
we keep talking about that. Like we keep getting to uh, the cross and we keep getting to um, other things that are in Daniel chapter nine, verse 26 and 27, the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Right. So those are, those are, and then we're going to go in verse 23 and 24. It's going to do a repeat and enlarge. Right. So it's now going to be um, re- enlarging upon that last previous verse. With the arms of the flood shall they, the Jewish nation, be overflown from before him. And the him, I believe, is God. Right? That's before the face of God, before him. And shall be broken. Right? And then when it says, yea, also the prince of the covenant, it's going back to Daniel 9, verse 26 and 27 talking about the crucifixion of Christ. So it's connecting the destruction of Jerusalem with the crucifixion of Christ. Does this make sense? More sense than what we had before. Because then verse 23 and 24 expand on it, right? They go to the destruction of Jerusalem and uh, the diaspora. Because when we have a flood, that is referring to what happens to the Jews, Right. From pagan nations, they. They come in like a flood. Right. You have Assyria, right, Babylon, um, Greece and Rome. They, they all have this attribute. Um, and so when it says, yea, also the prince of the covenant. <laughs> um, that is, Christ is also going to be connected with this because we have the crucifixion of Christ and we have the destruction of Jerusalem are connected in Daniel 9 verse 26 and 27. Now this word translated as as also is just the Hebrew word gam. It's a gimel and a mem. And and it means lots of different things. Uh, Sometimes it means to gather properly assemblage um, but used only a verbally also even yea though often repeated in correlation both again alike right um in likewise manner sometimes moreover um sometimes uh, it can be attached to a negative but here so so what happens to christ in him being crucified that's going to result in the Jewish nation being overflown from before God's face. Does, does that make sense to people? That's all I need to know. Does it make sense? I'm having to think about this. Okay. I mean, it's definitely a way different interpretation of this verse. But remember, we've already put Christ in here and God in here in other places. So, we, we have a precedent for doing this that is, we can see that this is about Daniel 9 verses, you know, 26 and 27, that it's about the 70 weeks prophecy. That's, that's primarily what, um, Daniel chapter 11 is working towards, right? It's bringing us to this, to this, to this understanding of what's going to happen to Christ. 70 weeks and it's also going to connect us to the 2300 days and of course the 1260 and and all these other time prophecies in daniel so so this should make sense now now we had noted you know if we counted a back from april 5th 2030 2220 days we'd come to march 7th of this year which March 7th is an anniversary of the Sunday law, right? It's the first Sunday law in 321. Um, so, you know, so March 7th is a symbol of the Sunday law. So we would know that this arms of a flood. So if we're going to deal with uh, this arms of the flood, they shall be over overflown. Um, we, w- we would just have to put in here. Uh, destruction of Jerusalem. If we don't put the equal in there, we'll just put in there. And in our history, um, 
This is a reference to the Sunday law. And we can take this word arms and we can connect it to um, you know, the symbol of the Sunday law coming up March 7th and and to April 5th, 2030. So it just becomes a symbol in the word arms. Now this uh, flood and overflown, this 7857 or 7858, um, this refers to a period of, I thought I had it here. So it's 21 years and 187 days. Okay. So it's either 21 years and 186.75 or 21 years and 187.75, depending if you take 7858 or the 7857. So what would we do with that? Um, so um, any, any thoughts about what we're doing here? So we're saying that God is the one that um, that Jerusalem is overflown from before. So they are the they. So this is the destruction of Jerusalem before God's face. God's face. Okay, but we've got this thing with the arms of a flood. Yeah. Yeah. So with the arms of a flood. So I'm going to say that the arms, that word arms i'm just going to put this as a footnote i guess um so that is uh there are 2220 yeah i guess i'll just do it this way 2220 days from march 7th 2024 to april 5th 2030 so that that's the arms now the seven eight five eight is twenty one years and one hundred and eighty seven days. Okay, so we have that symbol there. <clears throat> okay, so with anything else about the arms of the flood there, so we know that this this refers usually to persecution to armies coming in, right? That's why I have a hard time adding it to just. Uh, executing his enemies i mean because a flood represents military armies coming in and like taking a you know conquering a nation or something like that and so um so this is the destruction of jerusalem it has to be and we just don't have to what the jewish nation this obviously would be god's people in some way um but probably the seventh day of Venice church okay go on are you trying to equate this with the the arms of a flood with the removal of the importance of the Constitution in the United States currently? Well, obviously it connects to the Sunday law. So if we're going to apply it to our history, yeah. It applies to the Sunday law because that that the uh, the repudiation of the principles of the Constitution that bring in the Sunday law um, are a conquering of the United States. Right. So so we're taking we take the flood as a symbol of the Sunday law. So yes. So at this point, I would say that the Jewish nation here in this context would refer to SDAs. So this is going to be the Sunday law that Seventh-day Adventists have to, to face. And, and that's a, a destruction. And so here they have executed. Um, I don't know if I would put executed here. Because we, we have persecuted. So we have, and also the Prince of the Covenant. So here we're going to refer to this to be Christ. And his crucifixion in 31 AD. Now here we put July 18, 2020 as a date, uh, symbolized in our history, which I'm not so certain about that it's not more 
addressing uh, so something more than just July 18, 2020. But for now, that's what we have there. <clears throat> But I think we should be able to see that this makes more sense with what follows in verse 23 and 24. And, and we see this, you know, at the end of verse 18, where it's going to refer to Christ taking the shame upon himself, the reproach, right? And then here it's going to go through this history of these kings, right? Presidents, emperors. And, and then it's going to come again to the crucifixion of Christ, but also the destruction of Jerusalem. And then verse 23 and 24, go back, do a repeat and enlarge, and bring us once again to um, the destruction of Jerusalem. And this is how uh, the Jews write things, prophecy. It's, it's repeat and enlarge. They add more detail as they progress through so it's not just a straight chronological explanation. Um, we have constantly have these repeated and enlarges. So to me, it makes sense. Does it make sense to anyone else? Not yet, but I'm thinking about it. Okay. Anybody else? Well, what I've been thinking about is in Acts chapter 8, where after the persecution began, then the church was, was scattered abroad preaching the word. So when intense persecution comes before us, we better be prepared to be scattered abroad, you know, and giving giving the message. Yeah. We'll, we'll be empowered to do so by then. Mm -hmm. now, now, the persecution that happens in Acts chapter 8 is the persecution of the church against, well, the Jewish nation against the, the church, right? Well, that... That's what I was referring to because I don't think, like what I can, what I'm not saying is a thus saith the Lord, but I mean, from what I can see of uh, living with very, very apostate SDAs here, I mean, there's absolute hatred against me and others who are, who are, uh, who are trying to maintain a life and trying to keep up, up with this message. I mean, late the last month or so, it hasn't been so bad because I and others have been praying for peace, but this is just a tiny foretaste of what we're going to be facing. I mean, you yeah. wouldn't believe some of the things that have been going on here at times. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. this is a microcosm of what's going to be major uh, flare up. And right. you better so, be prepared. Yeah. So, so we know that, I mean, many of us have been treated badly by the church. Um, and, and not for good reason. I mean, just for their imaginings. Um, but here, this is, this is the language of the Sunday law. Uh, the Jewish nation would have to represent the Seventh day Adventist church because they're being conquered, right? And this is the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, of course, we know, um, that God's people, they're, they're not in Jerusalem when it's destroyed, right? Um, now, so they're good. The, um, so when it says that they shall be broken, and I put persecuted in there. Um, so we know that the Jewish nation, but I put SDAs, but also we know that this persecution is, is referring to a subset of SDAs, right? So not the Seventh day. So the Seventh day Adventist church in the Sunday law, we know that when the Sunday law comes in, you know, the enemy shall come in like a flood, but the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against them. Right. Um, so we know that there's going to be uh, a group of people when the Jews are conquered, when the Seventh-day Adventist church is conquered, that that are going to be a remnant. Right. So it's the remnant that's going to be persecuted. So um, now it said shall be broken, you know, I mean, put here persecuted. Now it could refer to, you know, I mean, the destruction of the city and the temple itself, you know, but, but that's kind of already said, you know, they're going to be overflown. 
And then when it says shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant, uh, to me, this would be a more specific reference to those that are, you know, God's true people, that they're, they're going to share this with Christ. And this, of course, is referring to the persecution. Not that happens when Christ is crucified. This is going to be the persecution that happens later, after the destruction of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is destroyed. I mean, Christians, in a sense, are Jews, right? Um, but they're going to be persecuted. They're going to be broken. Just as Christ was crucified. Now, so we can see that this crucifixion of Christ is referring back to something earlier because the destruction of Jerusalem is after the crucifixion of Christ. And that's why I put July 18, 2020 there as a symbol of the crucifixion of Christ. And, and we understand that this is a symbol, July 18, 2020, for events leading up to the Sunday. So, I mean, we could probably put there, uh, you know, the whole 777 structure. That might even be better than July 18, 2020, but it, July 18, 2020 is contained within that 777 structure. So, so I could put July 18 in the 777 structure. How's that? Okay. Anyone else? I mean, cause this, this is quite a departure from what Swearingen had and what, uh, Uriah Smith had, but anybody has had. I mean, as far as I know, nobody's interpreted it this way. I also want to just um, uh, look at this word here that's covenant. Now, you'll see the they have there in Strong's, he has the Hebrew number 1285, right? So 1825. And if we go here, so I'm going to show you this. Now, this is the word Beret. It means covenant or alliance. Um, if I clicked on 1287, you'll see it's uh, Boreth potash, so alkali used, used in washing. And um, that in the Hebrew, they're, they're, they're the same. You can see that they look the same. Right. Now, of course, um, there, there may not be um, a linguistic connection between these because we know bara means to cut. Right. And so the idea of cutting a covenant. Now, so obviously, you know, if you're going to take the prince of, uh, you know, the covenant, that makes more sense than the the prince of vegetable lye or soap used for washing. But I just wanted to note that it, it is a similar similar word. And in my uh, Scholar's Gateway, they actually put both numbers there. And I'm not sure why they put 1287, but they do. Um, and just because it's it's the same Hebrew word technically. Okay, so, so we have the Prince of the Covenant, uh, also the Prince of the Covenant. We have the Arms of the Flood. Um, we have this broken. So this word broken means to burst or break in pieces. Um, shatter. To be broken, be ma maimed, be crippled, be wrecked. So this would probably be more the definition here. To be broken, be maimed, crippled, and be wrecked. Be crushed figuratively. So shabar. Okay. Are people having trouble with this? I mean, uh, I've had Dwight and Angela comment. Are people having trouble with this reinterpretation of this verse? I mean, I'm not having trouble with it. I think it makes the most sense, but I, I may not be right. Just because it makes sense to me doesn't mean it's correct. Now, um, the word that's translated broken, um, it gives us a period of 20 years and 360 days, exactly. So if you take 7665, you divide it by 365 and a quarter, it gives you 20 years. And then the remainder gives you 360 days. 
is is that significant at all? It certainly should be. Okay, it should be. Right, because it yields that symbol of 360. And um, it gives us also 20 years. Just notice the typo here. So we got, um, you know, the difference here, you know, one's 20 years and 360 for uh, this word um, broken. And then you got this uh, 7858 and 7857 that are 21 years, 187 days. So both of this yield uh, symbols. The Samson rule, 20 years. Um, but I would try to apply this more to, because we do have the symbol of 20 years in Samson that we apply to our history. Now, um, so, you know, we can see pretty clearly if we were to count from a, a date, I mean, you're just going to take like five days less. So if you don't, if you counted from September 11th, 2001, and you counted uh, 20 years, um, you'd have to go to 2002, uh, 2022 with the 360 to get September uh, 6th. Get September 6th in 2022 if you counted that, right? So it's it's an easy span to count from some date to some other date. So I don't know if we could put it as a span of time somewhere, but as a symbol, it symbolizes, uh, you know, the, the remainder of the day symbolizes the year-day principle, the prophetic year. <clears throat> so there, there's probably something more in there that we would have to examine. But again, for me, the whole reason why this makes sense is because what follows in the next two verses. But it's going to cover that history of the destruction of Jerusalem. Any other thoughts? Is the comment from the chat a um, a valid comment for what we're talking about right now? Well, yeah, because we looked at the 20 years of Samson already. They already exist in our lives. Okay. Right. So, so I'm just saying, um, we we can apply the 20 years as a symbol in our lives. Now, offhanded comment. Um, I think the um, comparison of Parmender with Pompey is an insult to Pompey. Um, well, Pompey comes in and, and besieges Jerusalem. So, right. Uh, so we're just, we're just comparing that. I mean, I don't care about insulting Pompey. Um, the question, the, when dealing with those verses, the, the idea was that this is referring to those events that happen within our movement. Right? Cause this is, so verses 23 and 24 are addressing that, that history of this 9-11 movement. And um, so if we're going to look at the siege that occurred, the question is, well, what caused the siege? In, in, in Roman history, it's going to be Pompey. In, in our history, can we mark the siege by any event? And to me, that would be Parminder. And, and, the, and you know, in some ways, like Parminder was a great strategist. I mean, his plan and how he executed it to take over the movement. It almost completely succeeded, right? I mean, he almost ended up with the School of the Prophets in control of FFA. If, if he would have been a bit wiser, he might not have moved so quickly, you know, with his, his rebellion. But, you know, I don't think he could help himself. And Tess was kind of in charge. And, you know, people get get it in their head that they're greater than they really are. So I don't know if it matters that it's an insult to Pompey. I'm just looking that, you know, Pompey had accomplished quite a bit for Rome. And Parminder was looking to accomplish quite a bit more for himself. His, you know, furthering the interests of, of papal Rome, possible. Yeah, they, they both are. Yeah, he's furthering the interests of the agenda of the papacy. I mean, he gets a conservative Adventist movement, the majority of the people, to abandon 
pretty much everything, especially the idea that there is a Jesuit conspiracy. And, and so we abandon that, these, you know, his followers do. And, and also basically just accept, you know, the Pope, right? I mean, you know, to call, you know, Francis the good Pope, um, and to believe that, the, you know, he's not the enemy. I mean, he's a Jesuit. Um, but, you know, there's no Jesuit conspiracy, according to Parminder and Tess. And even though it's plainly stated in the spirit of prophecy, you know, there is a conspiracy. A lot of the conspiracies people talk about aren't real. But there is some that are supported by the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And the Jesuit conspiracy is one of them. So, and it, it's the main conspiracy, right? It's, and, and the Jesuits have, their goal is, um, you know, obviously a lot of the other things that we see are a part of that Jesuit conspiracy to, to destroy, to undermine society. Um, the reason is that the Catholic Church believes that it can come in and be the savior for all this destabilization that's occurring. And if you understand um, the Catholic Church's um, view of economics and social institutions and so forth. Um, they're trying to destabilize institutions around the world, but they, they're not anarchists. I mean, they have their own institutions that they want to replace them. So anyway, um, so dealing with this, this part, verse 22, or, are we going to accept what we've placed there? Are we going to call question to it? At this point with this through verse 22, I think yeah. we need to give consideration of this for today and then return to it. Okay. Because we've got, we've got a lot of other portions that we have, we've given an application of course, in the red, and we have several where we have the definitions in the black where we're not making other presentations. Like we're not making an interpretation, let's say, of God's face? Correct. Yeah, which I don't think we it would still be the same in our history. Well, I'm also looking at whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. We're just, we're bringing this back as an omnibus to this with Obama to Trump. Yeah. So we're saying that, yeah, Trump does not, is not given the honor of the kingdom. Right. Yeah. So that we understand that that, that describes Trump. Right. So that's Tiberius. That's Trump. We're just saying that when we get to verse 22, it's not talking about Tiberius anymore. Right. It's going to refer back to the crucifixion of Christ that occurs in the time of Tiberius, but it's looking forward to the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. And, and that fits in with what we see in Daniel 9, verse 26 and 27. So this is an expansion of that. And then verses 23 to 24, these are... Uh, this is, in a sense, a separate line. This is going to go back to the Jewish League and lead to the destruction of Jerusalem and even beyond. It's going to bring us to 3030 AD, or 330 AD, pardon me, 330 AD. So it's going to bring us to, uh, you know, Constantinople. So, so this line itself, 23 and 24, um, when we we put them on the line here, so this is the part we have not yet done. Yeah. So um, so we're gonna we're gonna say this is verses twenty three and twenty four. We put as Titus, right? And now we're putting this as Biden. But this is it's it's leading us to this event, the destruction of Jerusalem. So when we deal with with twenty two. See, I would then take uh, this verse 22 um, and, and take it away from here and add it on to here. 
either put 22 to 24 or even put 23 and 24 as, as a repeat of history to be more consistent. Yeah, I could see 23 and 24 as the repeat. Yeah. Right, because this is going to go back over this time. Okay, so we just put 22 there. Now, now, now we put Titus there because that's the destruction of Jerusalem. So it's going to address it there. Um, but now we're going to have this repeated, right? So it's, it, it's gonna, it's this repeat in a large takes this whole history. Now, part of the thing, the problem with the line here, so if we're not going to deal with the line below right now, but so 23 to 24 is going to go through all of this history that leads up to the destruction of Jerusalem. So that it is a repeat of history. That is our line, right? In our line, that's the repeat of history. So we're in a repeat of history. Um, so there is this, this, th that is this line is typifying what's going to happen in uh, the fourth angel arriving. Now, Stephen kind of missed out what we were doing. And I want his opinion on this. Now, it's going to be tough for him uh, because he didn't have the long explanation. So what we did, Stephen, is we took verse 22 and we completely reinterpreted it. And so when it says, and with the arms of a flood shall they, the Jewish nation, be overflown, uh, that's going to be referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and from before him is from be the him is God's face. So that's God's face before him. That's just um, if you take that whole phrase. Uh, that's from before God's face. And shall be broken that is persecuted. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. So the way that I'm looking at this verse. Is that I'm saying that. Um, <clears throat> it's not talking about Tiberius. It's going to go to the time of Titus. And it's going to then be expanded upon in verse 23 and 24. So it's going to go back to the Jewish league and show why not just the crucifixion happens, but why the destruction of Jerusalem happens. And this makes sense in the context that this is talking about Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. That's the primary um, reason we have Daniel chapter 11 in the first place is it's, it's going to expand on that history, bringing us up to when Christ is crucified, what nation he's crucified under. So even though the crucifixion of Christ happens in the time of Tiberius, the, verse 22 isn't, isn't going to the time of Tiberius. It's dealing with what's going to happen as a result of uh, the, the crucifixion of Christ. That's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem. And then verses 23 and 24 just repeat that history. I know that's really short. What, what do you think of that? So um, you're, still, you're still saying the vile person is Tiberius. I'm saying or what? That you're, you're still saying the vile person. The vile person is Tiberius. Yeah, that's Tiberius. Yeah. It's just say, I'm just saying verse 22 doesn't refer to Tiberius. When it says, uh, and with the arms of the flood, they shall be overflown. Well, we have the language of, the, of a nation being conquered, not of enemies being executed. Right. right okay, so that's what that was your ask, missed application. Yes, that's the primary application is this is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, not to uh, Tiberius uh, being um, uh, broken, right? And then it says, I mean, this whole language is the language of the Sunday law, and it has nothing to do with Tiberius. Now, it, it's talking about Tiberius before that, but then it's going to talk about, it's going to jump to the destruction of Jerusalem. So the they is not the the people who are the seditionists, right? Or whatever. Kind of the, out to Rome. 
Yeah. So yeah, yeah, because he because uh, the way that's framed in the alleged seditionists that that's what he had they referring to. You know, the ones who are, you know, he thinks are good, but that doesn't make sense. I mean, they don't come against Tiberius with the arms of a flood. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, if we say overflown from before him, but from before his face, well, the question is, who is the him? And, and this, if we look in the context of what we've been studying, how we've been looking at Daniel 11, that it's, that chapter 11 is really an expansion of, of Chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. And that's, you know, the main part of it. It deals with the 70 weeks prophecy, but specifically to the end of it. Um, then, then this makes sense that it's, it's from before him or from before God's face. So this is the Jewish nation receiving this punishment, right? Which symbolizes the Sunday law. And then, and then a remnant are the ones who are going to be broken or persecuted, right? So this is this is bringing us to the diaspora and and all of that. And then the prince, and then it says also the prince of the covenant. So it's just saying, just as Christ was crucified in a sense persecuted, that result is going to happen to the Jewish nation. Then verse twenty three and twenty four is just a repeat of this with more details goes back to um, it's going to address the destruction of Jerusalem, but also uh, the events that happen with Rome itself. And it's going to deal with these 360 year periods. And we've already applied that in our lives. So, so we just need to fill that in. Does this make any sense to you, Stephen? Right. I couldn't really get people to agree. It makes sense. Dwight says we have to think about it for a day. Yeah, I think it's, um, I would have to sort of see over it again, your logic before I watched, I watched what, uh, you, how you began. Just yeah. Over it again. Yeah. But initially, yeah, yeah it, does, it, does, it could be potential, but I'd have to sort of, uh, just shoot off. I'm not sure. I'd have to sort of, uh, Look at it a bit more detail. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, but to me, it makes perfect sense. So, you know, um, based, but there is a lot of, a lot of lines of thought, and, and I don't know how well I explain them, but, um, it fits in with how we've been looking at Daniel 11. So to me, that the thing about Daniel 11 and the lines here is that you know, we'd always looked at it sort of just as, well, we were trying to find what event in history is being fulfilled. But when we understand the purpose of Daniel, it's, it's, it's context. Then we start to see God's hand more in it and, and God being referenced and Christ being referenced in ways that we never noticed before. And, um, so, you know, that's why, I, you know, it, it just made more sense to me. I was really struggling with the alleged seditionists being connected with the Sunday law because we know with the arms of the flood, they shall be overflown from before him. This is referring to symbols that we have throughout scripture that we apply to the Sunday law. Right. Right. So, so it, it makes no sense to apply this to alleged seditionists. How, how would they have anything to do? With that, and and if we're going to deal with it as a type, it's it's armies coming in, right? The flood is a flood of armies, right? We, we don't have that with Tiberius, so so this to me just makes more sense if in the context of what we've been looking at. But yeah, I know people have to think about it a bit more. Okay, so. Um, so when we go back to that diagram, then the idea here now is we're, we're saying that uh, t- verses 23 and 24 are a repeat of history, just as as our history is. So these would be a separate line. That is, we could we could take so that as we could take those verses dealing with the Jewish league, and we could draw them on a line themselves. That's what we're saying when we're saying it's the fourth angel arriving. And, and so we would have to take that, those, those verses 23 and 24 
and have them as a separate line in our history. Right, so we, we would have a new line, and then we would have to say, well, what is that referring to in our history? And, and I would say it's referring to uh, the line addressing um, uh, what's happening in the movement. That this, we, you know, it's not, even though it has things that can, we can attach to the Seventh day Adventist church, it's going to be part of that line. That primarily the focus of these two verses in our application is, is going to be in this internal application. So if we start here on looking back at these uh, verses 23 and 24. So notice we go to 911, right? So that means that this, this line is going to be addressing the history from 911 to some time in our history. And we can see how what happens with the church, this spiritual formation of the Protestants, right? This is where this league occurs. Um, and then we're saying that, that this is really a league with the papacy. Even though we have uh, the Protestants involved, uh, spiritual formation comes from St. Ignatius of Loyola. At least that's what the Catholics call them, right? These are the spiritual exercises. <clears throat> and, and they shall work deceitfully, right? This, this is what happens within Adventism. So they use the League for furthering the Roman interest in the Eastern regions. Um, and, and there's a furthering of the interest of papal Rome within Adventism. And then we look at Pompey and Parminder. So... You know, Dwight was saying it's an insult to Pompey to compare him with Parminder, but it's nothing to do with insults. It has to do with just what does Pom Pompey do? He he has a siege of Jerusalem. Now we can see that this siege of Jerusalem here in this story, obviously it relates to this, the siege and destruction of Jerusalem later, right? So we're going to have Titus. And, and so in this line, when we, we actually put this line, um, which we're not going to have time to do today, we'll, we'll probably start on it tomorrow. But when we, we draw this on a line, I mean, we're going to have this Jewish league in there. and We're going to have to see how it fits with 9-11 and, and how, but, but first we have to draw the line itself, right? We have to draw the historic line of these events. Now, these events then are going to start with the Jewish League, right? Uh, they're going to have in that, that line, we're going to have the siege of Jerusalem. So there, there would have to be some events in between there, I would think. Maybe not. Um, you know, when he enters in peaceably, even on, upon the fattest places of the province, you know, which is Syria, Judea, Egypt, you know, we have events connected with that historically. And then we're saying that when he's going to do that, which his fathers have not done, or his father's fathers, that this is going to be the destruction of Jerusalem. And he will scatter the prey, the spoil, and the riches, which is the dispersion of the Jewish people after the destruction of Jerusalem, often known as the diaspora. And then it says that he's going to forecast his devices against um, or from the strongholds. Now, what we would do with that is, is we would say, well, these are events that we could put in the line. We could, so uh, I guess a simple way to look at it, maybe in a sense we've already drawn that line. <clears throat> because we have uh, this line here. And we just need to add more detail. That is, this line would have uh, the Jewish League in it. Oops, you can't see it yet. Didn't hit share properly. Okay, so so in this we would have to go back to this Jewish League um, and put that in there somehow. Um, you know, Battle, Battle of Pharsalus, Battle of Actium. Uh, we have in here the cross and the temple being destroyed and and then the Edict of Milan and then the removal of the capital from Rome to Constantinople. So 
these would be the dates or the events in this line. And, and so this would be verse 23 and 24, right? We just, we just have to draw it out properly on the line itself. And then, and then if it's a line, you know, we have each of the way marks and then we have a specific spirit, uh, period of darkness and show, uh, how this, um, ends up being a line and why it ends with the events that it ends with and what role uh, these other dates and events have in this line. Any any questions about this? Can we see that, that, that this can easily be turned into a line, a logical progressive line, a three-step testing progressive message, prophetic message, right? No, it's going to, you know, demonstrate and um, uh, develop and demonstrate two classes of worshipers normally in a gospel line. Here, that may not be the purpose of it. Um, and then we have to understand, you know, we have the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, you know, we have the Edict of Milan, which is going to address uh, persecution from, uh, of, you know, in that history. Why, why the removal of the capital from Rome to Constantinople? Why would the Battle of Pharsalus and the Battle of Actium have anything to do with this line particularly? Right. We, we already have them here as events that mark periods of 360 years, but, but we don't have them as a line yet. So, I mean, what we would do with this line here, I'm just going to try to modify this just to give us some more room. Now, Stephen, you had drawn a chart out kind of um, dealing with the 62 years. I want to look at that. I'm going to bring that up. Okay, Stephen, uh, can you just explain your line here? I mean, it's pretty simple, but if you're able to, I can explain it if you want me to. Um, right, okay. So we have here, it's, it's noted than um, Daniel. 531, that when Babylon falls, Darius is 62 years old. Yep. So, sort of a wee bit curious about why it does that. So there's some reason it may. And so this is maybe like a potential uh, connection. Yeah, so, and, and the thing is about the 62, it just as a symbol that we have the 62 weeks in the prophecy. So, so it relates to that as well, but you're just taking the 62 years themselves. Yes, and another thing about 601 BC is that was the Battle of Migdal. That was when Nebuchadnezzar first made that foray into Egypt. Yeah. yeah so we talked so about when that. he does that, so when he does that, that's the year Darius is born. And then at the end of that, when Babylon falls, that's connected with these here 126 shekels. Yeah. And that's, that's the head of the image of Daniel chapter 2 ending mm -hmm. and then it's uh, 508 years which is uh, you know is a span which as a date would connect with the taking away of paganism yeah. um, but this year's structure doesn't seem to it sort of bypasses it somewhat but it, so I just uh, connected that then to what you were saying about the 62 years from Actium to the cross in this yeah. point. Yeah. And then it's uh, another 508 years in this of reckoning uh, to the fall of Rome, in the Western mm -hmm. Rome, and that would be, I have here, I sort of thought about this here, maybe not quite correct. I have here the iron legs of the image of Daniel chapter 2 ends, which I sort of, uh, I took a sort of hesitantly I thought about that, whether would that be correct, because you have uh, Eastern Rome still continuing. Yeah, so, so one, of is, one of the legs is amputated or something? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Got a peg leg out? I think it, yeah, so uh, I think um, the pioneers today have where, uh, they have two legs. Do they make out Western Rome and Eastern Rome? Was that their application? 
Yeah, I, I don't know if people actually put the, the legs. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember what, what generally we hear about the two legs. Um, mm-hmm. some, sometimes people talk about pagan and papal Rome being represented there. Um, but anyway, yeah. But anyway, you have the even if you were going to apply to to one of the legs to Eastern Rome, you have the iron and clay being formed even before that leg would end. You know, you have that occurring in five thirty eight, that churchcraft and statecraft. So to me, it's, it's maybe legitimate then. You could say that. The MHA ends, and then you have that 62 year period where you have the beginning of the 1260, and that sort of connects with the 62 years that you have that mini mini take of your first one, 126 there. Mm-hmm. Sort of like a parallel to that. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's all I have to say. Okay. Yeah. So do you think, do you think, it's, do you think it's valid, the application? Oh, it's definitely valid. I mean, I would accept this. Um, and, you know, because it, it's a structure that's consistent with what we already understand. And it's it's attaching the fall of Babylon to the fall of Rome. So we know that Leviticus 26 is going to deal with the captivity of the Jews uh, by Babylon. And Deuteronomy 28 is going to address, uh, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome. And both of these um, have a fall, right? And, and, and this helps tie in this fall with the symbol of the cross. Um, so in some ways you're looking back from, you know, 1 AD or 1 BC or whatever it is. You're looking back, um, and, and you're seeing 31 and then you're going to see 539 matching 476 and then 601 matching 538, right? So you're looking at this sort of from the, the center of this. Um, and of course, uh, it ends up with, um, you know, different numbers. So that's what I'm trying to figure out here. Now, when you have the 508 years, you're counting that, um, from the center. Right. Well, where are you counting the 508 years from? 31 BC. That's what I'm kind of puzzled by. Oh yeah, I think I made a mistake there. Yeah, that there, 507 years is wrong. I think it's, it's kind of yeah, that would be from Magdalen, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be from uh, the cross. Trying to yeah. So yeah. So, so it wouldn't be valid. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I wouldn't put 508 there. Um, from no, because it's more, it's more like 4, 4 something 6, 4, 3, 6, is it? 4, 4, 6. Yeah, 4, 4, 0, 4, 0, 7, 4, 0, 6. So, so we'd have to figure out how, how we address that. So that pro- that's the problem there, the 508 years. Um, yes. So I'd have to think about that. Yeah, if you were going to, and even if you were going to 508 AD, it still wouldn't yeah. be 508 years from the cross. Yeah, so th- that that would be yeah from the, from the cross to uh, 538. That should be. That's where I made uh, a mistake. Yeah, so you're going to have um, 445 years from there. So I'd have to I'd have to think about this a little bit more. But the 508, uh, as a symbol in the back, it does attach to 508 AD as a symbol. So that's, that's what we'd have to think about there. But yeah, that would be 400 and, or 500 and, and six years, I guess. Or 507 years. What is it? 30, so 506, 507. No, that doesn't make sense. Oh, I'm adding them together. Instead of subtracting them, so so what you could do is you could just add them together. Thirty-one plus four seventy-six. Yes. Right, just as an addition. I think that's what I would do. So instead of saying it's an inclusive count, it's just adding those together as an inclusive count. 
That would make sense. So that's something we're going to have to think about. Okay, well, we're done for today. Okay, thanks, Stephen, and uh, everyone else. Let's close with prayer. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning, and we just pray that we can think about these things and come together uh, tomorrow to discuss them further. Uh, we ask for your strength and help today in all that we do, that we may glorify you. And we pray uh, for one another and uh, for your angels' care and protection. Uh, we know, know these truths are precious, and we pray that we can uh, value them and understand them and share them uh, with those that you lead us to. And we thank you for all things, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.